This is better. I hope this is better. Okay, I'm going to be going over reaction reaction mechanisms, specifically substitution reactions. It's one of the core reactions for organic chemistry. Later, you will find yourself using these reactions within other reactions as you progress along the course. So let's get started. The topics for this session include what is a nucleophile, what is an electrophile, SN1, SN2, and then comparing SN1 and SN2 reactions, and finally, looking at how solvents affect the reactions that are occurring. So what are mechanisms? Mechanisms show how the arrow reactions take, show how the reactions take place. So what does this mean? Well, just like resonance arrows, and I imagine you already know how to do that, and you've already covered that in your organic chemistry class, it's the same thing. The arrows show how the flow of electrons. It shows how these electrons are moving, but now in reaction mechanisms, we're going to use them to show bond breaking and bond forming. And we're going to show how this happens step by step. So mechanisms are just showing you how a product is formed, how it actually happens, and we do it through the use of arrows. The arrows just signify where the electrons go and what's going on. Sort of like the behind the scenes. So let's draw a molecule, draw it with me. We have a carbon, so CH3, connected with the Cl, and this would be chlorine. So. Now, let's draw this with Now, let's draw this or this reaction. We're not going to give it a name. You might already know the name, but we're not going to give it a name. So, just look at this as a reaction. Okay. Okay. So let's use N A O H. And one thing to notice is that usually when you have an A or a K, um, it's usually a plus. That's a ionic bond. So N A would be sodium. Sodium isn't involved in this reaction. It is just a spectrated ion. It's there to stabilize. DOH, which is your, in this case, it would be your attacker. So let's label it as such, oh, attacker. And this NA is just a spectator ion. So another name for this molecule right here, this is your substrate.
and the attacker here would be your reactant. So we've established that this is the substrate right here, and this is the reactant. Well, let's see how this reaction occurs. As we know that a negatively charged oxygen, because the oxygen is negatively charged, negative isn't on the hydrogen, we know that it means it has an extra lone pair. Oxygen, when it's neutral, already has two lone pairs. However, when it's negative, it has an extra set of lone pairs. And it's going to use that extra set of lone pairs right here to do the following thing. It's going to take these lone pairs and it's going to attack this carbon. We will see why this happens, but right now we're just looking at mechanisms and how these arrows in green that I'm showing right here show the flow of electrons. So it will attack this carbon. Now, remember, carbon, carbon can only have four bonds at a time. At a time. So what happens? That means that this bond right here between the carbon and the chlorine will have to break in order to form a bond between this carbon right here and this attacker or reactant right here. So let's keep it consistent with green. That bond would break and those electrons will now move to that chlorine. So let's draw the product of this reaction. Well, let's label OH in pink. So that would go here. And as we just mentioned, it would be making a bond to carbon. Okay, that's the new thing that happened. And remember, it still has those three hydrogens it was attached to. So everything's the same, except now the chlorine was replaced by the OH. And that OH attacked that carbon. The reactant, which was NaOH, was the attacker. And the substrate was basically what was attacked. So. That would be a product. So now what happens to the spectator ion and the chlorine? Well, actually, it's not that important, but if you would want to know, chlorine, we establish it's negatively charged. Sodium is positively charged. These two combine in an ionic bond, and we get NaCl. So see how these green arrows help show the flow of electrons. That's what mechanisms are, is showing you the flow of electrons. And different types of mechanisms have different types of steps. So we're going to look at specifically substitution reactions. And this was a type of substitution reaction, the example I just showed. It's the SN2 reaction. And we'll see why that is in a bit. But as it says in the name, substitution reaction, you're substituting one thing for another. So here we substitute chlorine for an OH. We're just replacing it. So what is a nucleophile? Nucleophiles are electron rich. So what would be the nucleophile in this scenario? It would be this. Because it is electron rich. That OH minus as we said, has three pairs, three lone pairs. So it has a lot, and therefore it can afford to donate a pair of electrons. A lone pair or an extra lone pair will form a bond. As we saw this right here, you get an extra lone pair. It doesn't even have to be an extra, it's just if you have the ability to donate a set of a set of electrons or a lone pair, that's a nucleophile. So as we saw, it is the attacker, and it's also the reactant. So here are a list of common, oh, it's the reagent, I apologize. 
to be Egypt. Egypt. No problem. So I was, I was getting a little too into it, but it is the reagent. So these are a list of common reagents. It's not necessarily telling you if it's a good reagent or a bad reagent, but it's just a list of the common ones you will see. Later on, we'll discuss the strong and the weak nucleophiles. Now, I have a question. Are double bonds and triple bonds nucleophiles? So let's draw double bonds and let's draw a triple bond. Are these nucleophiles? The answer is yes. They are, yes. If you said yes, then you're correct. They are nucleophiles. Now, why is that? Well, there's a hidden lone pair there's a hidden negative charge within these double triple bonds so do not draw this on your exam because the professor will mark you wrong but let's let's just entertain this idea and you, you'll see why so if you draw this resonance arrow and this double bond let's say it's attached to r1 r2 r1 r2 We break one of those bonds, and then we get a lone pair here, a positive charge here. The reason why this is an insignificant resonance structure, and if you do draw it on your exam, you get marked those off, is because this can just go here, and that negative and positive charge can be canceled. So there's no need to have the negative and positive charges on that double bond, because that's very unstable it's so easy to make that stable if you just make a bond between those two charges however if you break that bond you break one of the double bonds or break one of the triple bonds you get a nucleophile but you also this is your nucleophile but this is also consequently your electrophile You'll see this later as you progress towards the end of the course, why this is helpful. And now let's do this for the triple bond. If the arrow moved towards the right, and then it said that's where the lone pairs will go, and then you have a positive charge here. So these are nucleophiles. So the answer is yes. Okay, so now that we discuss the nucleophile or the attacker. Now let's talk about the electrophile. Well, electrophile are ions that are electron poor. That means that they are, as we just said here, they have a positive charge. Sometimes that positive charge will be blatantly drawn out for you. However, sometimes it won't. It'll be hidden within the molecule and it's your responsibility to know where these positive charges are within the molecule. So because there is a positive charge, it means it's electron deficient. It wants some electrons and what you give it that a nucleophile can give it those electrons that it wants so desperately. So that's why you have an electrophile and a nucleophile in a reaction. Again, another name for electrophile is your substrate. So now let's try an example of where a positive charge can be hidden. So example one, I just use my, use my pen. Example one, I'm gonna draw this with, you have an oxygen, you have a double bond, you have a carbon here and a carbon there. Now, don't worry about what else that carbon is attached to. Let's just use R1 and R2 to, present, to represent the rest of the molecule. Now, with this molecule here, what would happen if I move or if I do a resin structure? You may have done resin structures for this molecule before. 
by the way, it's small key is a key time. Remember to practice your functional groups, but also you could just go throughout the course and gradually pick them up as you go. So if you draw a resonance structure, we're putting we're breaking that double bond, that pi bond, and replacing those electrons on that oxygen. So let me measure that in red here. Okay, now those electrons have moved to the oxygen. And again, let me denote that in red. And the rest will just be black. Okay, that's about that's a negative charge now. Which means that consequently, that carbon is now a positive charge because it has one less bond. It had four bonds, it was neutral. If you subtract the bond, it is a positive charge. So that means that looking at this molecule, this would be your electrophile. And this would be your nucleophile. Now they're not, there isn't always a nucleophile and an electrophile within a molecule. You you may see that, you may not. At least some cases are different. Like let's say, for example, this case, this molecule is all electrophile. There's no nucleophile within this molecule. So this is sometimes it may happen, but it isn't always the case. Uh, this right here is your electrophile, which means that if we redraw the same molecule that we did in the beginning, once more, this would be your electrophile. Now you see how it's hidden. It's hidden within the molecule. It's not just playing out for you to see. You kind of have to find it. And as you go on throughout the course, as you go on, Throughout the course, you'll be able to easily identify where a nucleophile will attack and where the electrophile is at. So let's look at another example, example number two. Let's give a slightly more, not difficult, but a bigger molecule. Okay. So this is your electrophile. But where on this molecule will a nucleophile attack? You won't attack every, anywhere. It's not equal in all places. There's a specific region where it will attack. And it's not hidden here through resonance. You might be tempted to draw resonance arrows here. Well, it is true that something can attack that area of the molecule. However, where you're not there yet, Take it one step at a time. That's something that you will learn later throughout the course, where you will actually deal with benzenes and their reactions. And actually, this is an aromatic ring. And you will learn that later, but you'll see reactions that have to deal with that aromatic ring. And the next course you take probably depends on the system you have with your a UC system, it would be the next organic chemistry of your semester system. It, I'm not too sure. I'm not too familiar with the way that the class progresses. So now, where is the electrophile? Actually, we know that oxygen right here is an very electronegative. It's a very electronegative molecule. It's not as electronegative as fluorine, but it is very electronegative. And because it's electronegative, it would cause a dipole movement through induction. This would be partially negative. This is partially positive. So it's not always resonance, or you don't have, always have to use resonance to find your electrophile. Sometimes it's just induction. If there is a negative charge somewhere near, or like a partial negative charge, it's caused by an electronegative molecule. And maybe that can cause an electrophile somewhere in your molecule. So you, these are things that you can use to identify where is the electrophile. So nucleophile will come to attack. We'll attack this part right here because that's where your electrophile lies. Now, again, let's review of how the arrow will move. And we did this once already, but let's do it again because you never have too much practice in organic chemistry. So 
We're drawing this molecule right here. And NaOH, it, sometimes your blue fob can sometimes be written this way. However, it won't always be. Also, this is your solvent. If your solvent isn't explicitly stated, you can assume it happens under aqueous conditions. There are times, and we will discuss solvents later, there are times where you will not be given a solvent. You just have to assume that there it's happening in water, and then you can use water to help with your reaction for like deprotonation and protonation, protonating a molecule. We'll see that later. But more often than not, H2O, your solvent is at the bottom. And your reagent or your nucleophile is at the top of that area. So again, we know how this reaction proceeds. We will attack that carbon. We will attack this carbon right here. Because you're attacking that carbon there. And carbon cannot have five bonds, five permanent bonds you'll have to let go of that chlorine. So what happens because of that is you have your OH, your HO here. Uh, uh, here now we know the terms for nucleophile and electrophile, which is this one molecule right here. But more specifically, the electrophile is that carbon. It's not the well, You can't attack the hydrogen. You can't attack the chlorine. You're attacking the carbon. And you're attacking the carbon because there's an induction, a dipole movement because of that chlorine. So this is partially positive and this is partially negative, which is why it's so easy for carbon to get rid of that chlorine and make a new bond with something else with your nucleophile. Again, we see here how chlorine was just replaced by that OH group. That's what substitution reactions are in a nutshell. You're just substituting one thing for another, but there are different ways that you can substitute something in different steps that can happen in your SN1 and your SN2. Here we see that it's okay to break single bonds. Before, when we were doing resin structures, you couldn't break a single bond. That's because if you break a single bond, in a resin structure, that's no longer a resin structure because it's no longer the same molecule. You're breaking a bond. You're breaking one of the single bonds and that is a lot, that takes a lot of energy. But here it is okay to break a single bond and you'll see that it, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. So Let's look at four mechanism core principles. As I hinted before, there are proton transfers. There are carbon cation rearrangements, and there is nucleophilic attack, as well as loss of leaving groups. So let's look at them one at a time. Proton transfer is also sometimes abbreviated as PT because once you get into the really like long mechanisms, you won't want to write out proton transfer all the time. You will just want to summarize it as just PT. So let's draw a molecule. And let's say that our nucleophile is, or not a nucleophile, but like let's draw a molecule and just assume that it's happening in their H2O. So this isn't like the nucleophilic attack. This is just a proton transfer. So like this is just a step within a mechanism. So, and this is why you assume to know that you have water at all times, unless it's explicitly stated that you don't have water. So proton transfer is a reversible step because it's just a hydrogen that's being moved around. So like shifted. Nothing is being replaced. It's just you're getting a hydrogen. So that OH can act as a nucleophile. Or in this case, it's not really appropriate to use the term nucleophile, but that OH 
because it is electronegative and because it has an extra pair of lone pairs that it donate, you can grab that hydrogen and cause a bond to break. And this would be your acid base reaction. This would be your acid because it's losing a proton to be a base skin. A proton. So now let's try this again. Now that OH in our starting molecule has two hydrogens, and what does it mean? That oxygen is now positively charged. Why? Because it has three bonds. It has one more bond than it usually wants to have at a neutral state, which is two bonds. And also because it only has one lone pair used, it's other lone pair to grab that hydrogen. So that would be a proton, an example of a proton transfer step. Let's look at carbocation rearrangement. Let's draw this molecule. We have a ring with CH3 attached here at the top. And now what does a carbon cation rearrangement mean? It means that you're shifting something in order to replace that positive charge in a different area, in a more stable area. So here we have it in a secondary spot and we'll see what that means later on in this video. But right now, just you may have already known that this is a secondary carbon, but we will explore that further later on. So let's look at the two nearest carbons here. Let's call this C1. Let's call this C2. Well, here we have two hydrogens here. And carbon cation rearrangement, you mostly see something that is called hydride shift. And a hydride shift is when you take one of the hydrogens that are nearby that carbocation and you shift it. There's no like actual reaction to taking place. It just Think of that hydrogen as jumping from one spot to another because you want the overall molecule to be more stable. So if you look at this carbon here and then this carbon here, well, if we take one of these hydrogens here and we shift it here, well, that's just going to be the same thing that we already have here because here we, already, we have a hydrogen. So this area right here has two hydrogens. If we were to take this here, well, it'll be the same thing that we started with. However, if we take the hydrogen that's on carbon one and move it here to the carbocation in this area, then suddenly it's not the same thing. Okay, so if we do that, it, we would have a different product or there would be a, an actual change instead of there being like no change at all. If we were to take one of the hydrogens of carbon two and put it on a carbon cation. So now let's imagine that that hydrogen jumps onto the carbon cation. And now that hydrogen that was in black is now there. Let's keep the colors consistent. But we're not looking at carbon tube anymore because it's matter because nothing happened changed in that area. So now what it used to be our cover cut in here isn't positively charged anymore. Because now that hole, or like you can think of carbocations as having like a hole, and then you want to plug up that hole. And usually you do with one into your file. But in this case, we're dealing with the hydrogen, and it's the same thing. Same principle applies. Now, that hole's plugged up, so that's no longer concern. Now, it was transferred to here, to this area. And that's more stable, because there's more things 
connected to that carbon cation. There's more substituents. Yes, hydrogen was still connected here in this area, but hydrogen isn't really like that significant of a molecule to have on your carbon cation because it's so small. So it doesn't matter. However, you have a CH3 now here. It's better. And this is something that's called a tertiary carbon cation. So we went from a secondary to a tertiary carbon cation. And that's a carbon cation rearrangement. You will usually see this. And also, as we said earlier, this is also known as a hydride shift. Usually do carbon cation rearrangements abbreviated as CCR for S and one reactions, because those are the reactions that you have a positive carbon cation intermediate. And why do we do a carbon cation rearrangement? Because again, tertiary carbon cations are much more favorable. And sometimes you can go from a primary to a secondary. It just depends on the molecule that you're dealing with. But this all happens to make the C plus for your electrophile more stable. So now let's move on to the third core principle, nucleophilic attack. So let's draw this molecule. We're going to connect it to bromine and it's just slightly complicated. Nucleophile. So this would be your nucleophile. This would be your electrophile. As we said earlier, if you have an A, an A sodium attached to your molecule, that's a spectator ion. So if reality it means that that oxygen is negatively charged, anything that Na is connected to, because Na is positively charged, that means that what it's connected to will be negatively charged. So because we know that, we know that that oxygen has three lone pairs. It's going to use one of them. Oh, it's got it wrong. It's going to use one of them to attack this carbon here again, reminding you that this is a positive charge here and a negative charge here because of induction. Now, because you're making a bond to this carbon, and this carbon already has four bonds, so remember that there's implied hydrogens that will not always be drawn or will never be drawn unless it's a stereocytic, stereocenter carbon that has hydrogens. So now, because it's making a bond here, the nucleophile is attacking this carbon here because that's the electrophile, and then it will have to break a bond in order to form a bond. Bromine will be released. So you will have this molecule, let me highlight it so it's less confusing. So this molecule will stay intact. The bromine here was connected here. So that will break, that no longer exists. So you have this and you're piecing it together with your nucleophile or your reagent, which is all of this. So now you have to add all of that. Let's highlight. So let's just put that oxygen and what came with it. So this would be your product. Let me draw this better. This would be product. And then if you want to know what happens to that NABR, it would just be NABR. That's not that important. Now, loss of leaving group. Let's draw some molecule that we have at top. Loss of leaving group is a reversible step. Notice that oh. notice that is shown with these types of arrows. So 
a lost living group is just when your living group, which in this case is bromine, leaves the molecule because it's stable enough to be on itself. So it's okay if it's on its own without making a bond, just floating around your aqueous solution. You can assume it's stabilized by the water. So if we do this, you'd end up with this, this molecule right here. And what does this molecule look like? It looks like this molecule right here that's right above. Loss of leaving group is a step that you find in SN1 and SN2 reactions. However, the way that you see it is a little bit differently. That's why you have your different substitution reactions. Now let's look at the SN1 reaction. What does it stand for? It stands for unimolecular substitution reaction. Uni as in one. You may be tempted to think that, okay, it's one. It happens in one step. No, it, it's one because it happens one step at a time is how I like to think about it. You take in one thing at a time. And the break determining step, or the it's caused by the first step that occurs. And the first step that occurs will determine how fast the reaction occurs. What does it depend on? It depends on your loss of leaving group. How good is your leaving group at leaving on its own and giving you an electrophile? And when a leaving group leaves, you will get your electrophile and a positive charge, you will see it. So you know exactly where it would react with the nucleophile. So how do you identify that an SM1 reaction will occur? The requirements are one, a good leaving group, two, a tertiary carbocation. What does it mean? It means a stable, a tertiary carbocation, also shown as this, is the most stable carbocation that you can have because that carbon, a positively charged carbon, is stabilized by three different R groups, three R groups, and a weak nucleophile. Steps for an SN reaction are as follows, loss of leaving group, possible carbon cation rearrangement, if applicable, it's not always the case, will not always happen. But it can. So make sure to look if it can happen and figure out can it happen? And if it can, it will. That's my favorite one. And then lastly, you have your nucleophilic attack. So in reality, this is like step 1.5. And this is step two. The requirements for an SN1 reaction. You need to have a good leaving group. And what's a good leaving group? Halides are good leaving groups. And what does this include? It includes iodine, chlorine, bromine. Usually you would see chlorine and bromine as your leaving groups. Maybe not too much of iodine, but more often than not, it would be chlorine and bromine. And this also includes sulfite. Ions, which are OTS and MSO. OTS is an abbreviation, and MSO is also an abbreviation for really large molecules that I will not draw because they will not be drawn on your exams. They will just be abbreviated at OTS. So you will have something like this. So that would be your leaving group. That whole molecule is very bulky, a little bit like, is it because it's bulky and it's very big, it's kind of ugly to draw, so that's why you just abbreviate it. So just worry about that. But if you're interested in knowing what they actually look like, just search it up and you will see why, why it's, it's not drawn. And the second thing, or the second requirement for an SN1 reaction to occur is a stable carbocation. So what's the least stable? The least stable is in going in order. Your least stable would be your primary, your middle ground. So 
your secondary and your most stable, which is what we want for an SN1 reaction, is a tertiary carbocation. So what does this look like? Let's draw this one for right here. Let's say this positive charge in the, on this carbon specifically. Well, what is that carbon connected to? Well, it's connected to this whole thing right here. That's true. But what else is it connected to? Well, since it's at the end, we know that there's hydrogens connected there. And applied hydrogens are not drawn. It's connected to two hydrogens because a positive carbon is connected to three things. So why is this called a primary carbocation? It's primary because there's only this whole thing is it can be denoted as R. It's connected to one R group. Connected because it's connected to one R group, it is a primary. One R group, one primary. You can also look at it in terms of the amount of hydrogens that are connected to it. There are two hydrogens connected to that carbon, so it is a second, it is a primary carbocation. Two pages attached to C. Plus. You can look at it in terms of R groups, you can look at it in terms of hydrogens that are attached to that area. Either one will work. Now let's look at the same molecule, but let's move that charge one carbon over. That's not this carbon. And you can usually easily figure out that it's a secondary carbocation when it's like a peak or a valley. Here, well, that R, the amount of R, R groups is sort of divided. This is R group one, this is R group two. There are two R groups. Two R groups, secondary carbocation, two, two. We want to look in terms of hydrogen. There's one hydrogen that's attached here. Because we already see that it's attached to two other things. We know that for a positive carbon, it has to be attached to three things. So there must be an implied hydrogen there. There's one hydrogen attached. So that's the second thing. Now for the most stable, well, let's use the same molecule. We'll put that positive carbon here, that positive charge here. Well, here we see that now those R groups are divided into three groups together. That's R1, R2, so thing is R3. It's connected to three R groups. If it's a tertiary, tertiary means three. And if you want to look at it in terms of hydrogen, so it's already attached to three things. So we know that positive carbons again, the carbon is attached to three things, not four, because if it were attached to four, that would be neutral. So no hydrogens attached. Now, with that in mind, let's look at the steps. So these are SN1 reaction steps. There's loss of leaving group, denoted as LLG. You can have a carbon cation rearrangement if it applies, and there's a nucleophilic attack. So let's look at an example more further detail. So let's say we have this molecule. Let's say that this has carbons attached to a bromine and a CH3 here. And let's just say that because it means a weak nucleophile, uh, one of the weak nucleophiles that you will primarily see is just water, so H2O. And that's just under aqueous conditions. It, can, it just reacts with water. The electrophiles, this substrate right here, will just react with water. 
Now here you will have the products, but now let's look at the step-by-step. -step. Well, let's do step one first. And what's step one? Loss of leaving group. So what's leaving group that's gonna leave? Well, as we saw earlier, we could leave the group as a highlight. And what highlight do we have here? We have bromine. So bromine will leave on its own. Because it's gonna leave in group, it's stable. Bromine, like Br negative or Br minus, is stable on its own. It can float on its own. So it doesn't need to be attached to the electrophile in order to be okay. It's fine on its own. So now let's try the molecule. After the leaving group is gone. Well, now we don't really need to draw the dash on the methyl group because there's no longer a stereo center there. So that could just be a line. So because of the loss of the leaving group, if you have a stereo center, specifically on the carb on the carbocation, you lose your stereo center. So you lose stereo chemistry. So now this is your step one. Now let's get your step two. And then we know here that there's one R group, two R groups, three R groups. This is tertiary carbocation. It's already the ideal carbocation that we want for this reaction. Every If you have a tertiary carbocation, less than one will always occur. So now let's look at the second step. Step two is nucleophilic tack. It's also being noted as NA. So what's your nucleophile? Water. As we discussed earlier, sometimes your reaction will happen under aqueous conditions. And when it's under aqueous conditions, you just assume that if you're not given an explicit nucleophile, water will be your nucleophile. It's a very weak nucleophile too. So it's a good indication that S1 will occur. So, so what happens? Well, it will attack that carbocation, but because it's so free now, now that there's no like other thing, and it's that positive charge is just kind of floating there by itself, it can attack from the bottom, or it can attack from the top. And because of that, we get two products. We get 50% of each. We get this one right here. Get this one. This is the OH, where the water on the wedge and then the CH3 remains on the dash. But also what can happen is that it could be an inversion of stereo chemistry. So your biggest substituent. will be on a dash instead of a wedge. What this mean is that if you initially had an R molecule, it would split into 50% R, but also 50% S. Same thing goes with if you started with an S, go to 50%. If the S molecule, so you retain 50% of what you started, but you also get 50% of the other. So 
your R. Now let's look at the products of an acetone reaction. Let's take a look at this further. If you have an electrophile that has a stereocenter, you get a racy mix mixture. That's what it means to have 50% this and 50% R. Now, why do you have that? Well, because now let's draw a different molecule. R1, R2, R3. And this is your positive carbocation. And this is a tertiary, then it has to be a tertiary in order for you to have a racy mi mixture. So if you were able to have an SN1 reaction with a secondary carbocation, you might not see this, but for sure it will happen with a tertiary carbocation that had a stereo center to begin with. And then now that you're having a nucleophilic path in your SN1 reaction, once that substitution reaction takes place and finishes, you will get 50% of RNS. No matter if you started with an R or if you started with an S, your products will be 50-50, it will be split evenly. So let's say this happens in the aqueous conditions, meaning again, water is your nucleophile. Now, let's use red and yellow and start with red. Well, again, you can detect in the top. It also detect in the bottom. And because of that, we get 50 50. So, R2, R1, R3, and then you will get, you use red. A wedge here. And then, in addition to this, oh wait. This will get it on the dash. Two, one, and three. So here would be your 50 50. This is a list of some strong nucleophiles. You only really need to know the strong ones because if you know the strong ones, you don't have to memorize the weak ones because automatically if, if you have a list of, okay, these are all the strong nucleophiles, you know that the rest are weak. You don't have to memorize both. If you memorize just one, you know that you automatically know the ones that are weak. So you don't have to stress about Oh, I have to memorize the strong ones, but I also have to memorize the weak ones. No, just memorize one, and you know one really well. You don't have to memorize the other. Now, why do I bring up strong nucleophiles? Because we're now getting into S and T reactions. S and T reactions that two stands for bimolecular, and I know it may be tempting to think of like bi, like it's in two steps. So why isn't SN1 the two and SN2 the one because it all happens in one step is because SN2 reaction has two steps. So there's two steps we saw in SN1, which happens one step at a time. It has those two steps happen all at once. And that is also known as a concerted reaction, which means that it happens all at once. The rate determining step or how fast the reaction occurs depends on what the nucleophile and electrophile because that all is happening at once. So they both determine the rate of the reaction. So let's abbreviate it as new and electrophile as build or e file. E file. So how do we know that an SN2 reaction will happen? The requirements are a strong nucleophile, a primary or secondary carbocation and as we saw this would be your primary this would be your secondary steps for an SN2 reaction include nucleophiles of the attack inversion of stereochemistry this isn't really just this isn't really a step it's kind of just a uh, consequence of a concerted 
reaction. Now let's look at the requirements a bit further. How do you identify that the SNT reaction will happen? You have a strong nucleophile. I just gave you a list of all the strong nucleophiles, not all the strong nucleophiles, but the most common strong nucleophiles that you'll see. And your second requirement would be your secondary, your primary or secondary cation. So let's use the molecules I just drew. This is your primary. This is your secondary. Now, let's look at it a little bit further. So we have this molecule. Having a good leaving group or a bad leaving group doesn't really matter for an SNT reaction because that nucleophile is strong enough to kick it out anyway. So let's use a strong nucleophile. A strong nucleophile, N-A-O-M-E. And usually a, a good indicator of a strong nucleophile is that it's negatively charged. So again, as I said, there I keep saying that if you have Na or Na plus or K plus sodium or potassium but also your molecule, you're not always exclusively have that positive charge there. You have to know that it's there. But if you have sodium Na or potassium K cooped up with your electrophile, you know that the rest of that molecule is automatically negatively charged. So if it's negatively charged, that's a strong nucleophile. So let's look at how this reaction proceeds. Well, again, as we saw earlier, there's an induction happening here. So this would be your partial positive, this would be your partial negative. Mm -hmm. That means that this area right here is your electrophile. That's where the nucleophile would be attacking. You have your loss of leaving group all at once because that, that nucleophile is so strong that it can just kick out that iodine this leaving group. It can just kick it out. It doesn't have to wait for it to leave on its own so that that nucleophile can attack because weak nucleophiles are for S and one reactions. That's why you have to have the carb cation. You have to have the leaving group leave first so now that the weak nucleophile can go on and take its place of the leaving group. But for a strong nucleophile, you don't need that. And the reason why you need a primary, as shown here, or a secondary Couple cations because those are less crowded. Less crowded for what? The nucleophile to go and attack. And it being less crowded means that the nucleophile is more free. Yes, it's strong, but what good is how strong it is if it, that molecule is so crowded? It can't really get to it. So, what does that do? It slows it down. SN2 reactions happen very, very quickly. Anything that slows down the nucleophile will make that reaction unfavorable. So, the process so of these. This reaction are as follows. Again, with substitute reactions, you're just substituting that leaving group. And this would be your product. And if you want to know what happens with the spectator ions, they form their own product on the side. This is not really important, but if you're just curious. So now let's look at steps of an SNT reaction. You have your nucleophilic attack and your loss of leaving group all happening at once. But something happens if you have a stereo, if you have a stereo center, if you have a carbon with a stereo center, and it only matters if your electrophile is in that stereo center or is part of that stereo center, meaning that it's the central carbon. And why does it happen? It happens because of a backside attack. So let's look at another reaction, more simplified. So let's have carbon in the middle. It's attached to chlorine. So methyl group here is CH3. And for sake of simplicity, let's say that's connected to R1 here and R2 here. Well, let's quickly label the priority of these substituents. Let's say R1 is like a very big, bulky molecule. Well, actually, let's say that it is just your primary, or really your first priority. Let's label this your second, and this as your third. 
if you follow the the one two three you get a uh, clockwise clockwise means that it's r it's an r configuration so we started out with r well now let's introduce a strong nuclear file into the mix and a b r is one and a plus spectator ion b r is negative wants to form a bond really really bad so now we're here with this br attack we'll actually attack actually let's make this r2 hydrogen yeah so this would be your secondary habitat ion drawing a better arrow this we are we'll attack here. Next side is attacking on the back side. Back side attack because that's where it's less crowded. Again, this reaction is very, very quick. You want everything to flow smoothly. If it goes to the back side, if it goes to the back door, that's where it's least crowded. So it can get to that carbon quickly and that reaction can happen much faster. We will have the loss of nuclear when nucleophilic attack. This is Na. This is LLG. Now what happens? We have a transition state. And for a very brief moment in time, we have this carbon. That's attached to chlorine, but also, again, very briefly, Attached to that bromine. So for a brief time, the loss, the leaving group, and the nucleophile are connected to the central carbon. So what happens? Well, because the bromine is now here and it's opposite direction of where the chlorine once was, we have an inversion of stereochemistry. So that means that since we started out with an R, since we started with an R, now we have an S. And this is our one. So this would be your first priority, your second priority, your third priority. Counterclockwise arrow. Now let's look. This is a simplified version of basically what happens. Like if you like are in an exam. If you're going to take anything from this slide presentation, I'd, I'd want you to take this. So just look at it for a brief moment. Hopefully you remember this because it's something very funny. Like I have an easier time remembering this, but see in a nest and one reaction, how this cat is occupying the space that this cat owns. So this is the electrophile, this is the nucleophile. And the electrophile is the bed. The cat, the great cat, is your living group. It leaves, like literally leaves the electrophile here. And now this weak nucleophile, let's just say this cat is like scared. It's not strong. It's, it's weak. It's a weak cat. So it doesn't want to fight for that spot on the bed. It would leave. The great cat will leave. You know, you lost your, your living group will leave. The electrophile now be will be unoccupied. Now the nucleophile or the weak nucleophile can now go and there's like nothing that happens. It just waits for it to leave. You know, it's very polite because it's weak. Now for an S2 reaction, we're dealing with yeah, the same orange cat, but like this orange cat now went, did some training, and now it's strong. And now that gray cat is in its spot. 
the electrophile is over here. This is the living group. Well, not because this cat is strong, kind of just kicks out the gray cat and now occupies that electrophile. That's just basically much of the S and S and T reactions. Now let's look at the energy diagrams. And some professors may stress energy diagrams a lot. Some may not. But it's just in case. Now here, this energy diagram, this is the, the loss of leaving group. That's the first step. So the first big mountain or thing that requires a lot of energy is the leaving group actually leaving. And why does that require so much energy? Well, it's because you're breaking a bond. Breaking a bond takes up a lot of energy as opposed to making a bond. However, however, there's like... So that's your rate determining step. And then your nucleophilic attack it's very minor because that's your second step it's not your first step so now let's look at the energy diagram of an SN2 reaction well here we see this transition state that we're talking about that's very like you're forming a bond but you're also breaking a bond simultaneously that also requires a lot of energy but also you see how here the rate determining step is in the nucleophilic attack and the loss and leaving group at the same time because it all happens at once because you have your electrophile and your nucleophile attached to the same carbon for a very brief moment in time. So how do we determine if an SN1 or an SN2 reaction will happen? We look at the electrophile. We look at the nucleophile, the leaving group, and its solvent effects. So what does it mean? Well, we see electrophile primary, secondary, or tertiary is the nucleophile strong or weak it's the leaving group good or bad and is a solvent protic or a product now let's take a closer look the electrophile as we just said it's primary secondary and tertiary primary will always be s s and one now your secondary depends usually s and two it just really depends on what you're leaving with. Like if you start with a secondary carbon cation, you can have a hydrate shift and turn it into a tertiary. Well, you've started with a secondary, but you could turn it into a tertiary, but it still started with a secondary. So it just, it depends on the molecule that you're looking at. So it usually, SN2. No, tertiary, it's very bad. It's a very bulky molecule. So a strong nucleophile will slow it down. It won't favor an SN2 reaction because of it being slowed down. So a weak nucleophile is fine with it being slowed down because it, it doesn't really matter. So always SN1. And it doesn't matter if it's slowed down because that's not the rate determining step. The rate determining step is the loss of leaving group. So it doesn't really matter what happens afterwards because the most important thing already happened. Now the nucleophile, is it strong? Or is it weak? If it's a strong nucleophile, SN2 will happen. If it's a weak, it's an SN1. Why SN2? Because it's strong enough to promote a concerted reaction. Again, what does this mean? It's strong enough to kick out that leaving group and attack that carbon all at the same time. However, an SN1 is very, it, it's, you're dealing with a weak nuclear valve. So a weak nuclear valve cannot kick out your leaving group. That's why you need a good leaving group because you need that step to happen first so that weak nuclear valve can come and attack. Now let's look at the leaving group. Well. 
and you, you need a good leaving group, especially for us in one. But like, even if you have a bad leaving group, the reaction may not occur, but like it's more likely to occur with a lesson two. It's not necessarily a requirement to have a bad leaving group for a lesson two, but it's not the end of the world, but usually you will not see a bad leaving group. But a good example of a bad leaving group that you may see is your OH here. Yes, this is a strong nuclear file, but it's a very bad leaving group. It doesn't want to leave. That oxygen is fine. It's all like this filled. It doesn't want to be oh, it's negative. Why would it be that when it could be just a neutral molecule? It's a very finicky molecule. That's why it's looking at this energy diagram. Having that OH, looks like this is your OH here. Having that is much more favorable. And it's worth breaking a bond and doing everything else. But how can we turn a bad leaving group into a good leaving group? Again, we said that with an easy proton transfer. We said that most reactions, unless stated otherwise, will happen under aqueous conditions. So this simple proton transfer step can make this into a good leaving group. So this OH can go and grab a hydrogen off another water molecule. And then, you no, know, it's minus. Yes, it's a no, it's minus. And yes, it's just said that it's not really okay being by itself. But again, from your general chemistry class, OH exists in very, in OH minus and H3O plus. So it's fine. It's okay because it exists in that sense. But also, consequently, we could have just started with an OH. Uh, three HVO plus. Oh, it doesn't really matter. You can just use the regular water molecule or water with an extra hydrogen. But because of this, you will get a positively charged oxygen. Now, this is a good leaving group because if it leaves, or when it leaves, you will be left with this cation and water. And where will water go? It will go back to the solvent. Now, let's look at solvents. Polar solvents consist of protic, protic and aprotic solvents. Now, what does this mean? Polar product solvents, or sorry, polar solvents, as we just said, can form hydrogen bonds. They bind to the nucleophile, and they stabilize the electrophile. So what does this mean? Well, it means that polar product solvents, they love a similar reaction. Polar well, A product solvents cannot bind to the nucleophile or the electrophile because they can't form H bonds. And they can't form H bonds because those solvents don't have a hydrogen. Polar product solvents have hydrogens. Why? What does this mean? They can form H bonds. So, polar A product will not stabilize the nucleophile and they will not slow down. The reaction. So, what does this refer? SN2. Now let's look at a product solvent and what it does. Well, let's say you have your nucleophile here. And let's say water is a good example of a product solvent. Well, this nucleophile will form H bonds, bond to a water molecule, because we know that water has a partial positive and partial negative side. Nucleophile is a negative molecule. So it would form hydrogen bonds. On the right. That would form this sort of like solvent shell around this nucleophile. And what does this do? It makes it harder for that nucleophile to attack, and that's why it's slowing down the reactions. 
what has a slow reaction? SN1. So a summary table to solve this. Well, apiotic solvents have no hydrogens. Apiotic solvents have hydrogens. So let's look at some apiotic solvents. Well, coming on to our DMSO, DMF, HMPA, acetone, also denoted as M E two C O and aceto aceto nitrile to M E C N. The nitrile is this. The aceto is an acetone. Is this? So. Again, there's no hydrogens in those molecules. And if you want like DMSO, DMF, and HP, HMPA are just abbreviations for molecules. But if you want to know what they look like, they are a hassle to draw. So usually they will just be abbreviated. And again, solvents are easier to read about when the solvent is found under the arrow. Sometimes if you have a, if you're given a problem like where a problem usually will tell you the solvent it's under like aqueous conditions or like dmso DMF. but you do have to memorize this too you do have to know the apiotic solvents okay you can just memorize all the apiotic solvents and that way you don't have to memorize the product solvents but if you're given the like you don't really have to memorize the product solvents because it has hydrogen in it so and it's specifically stated if I give you this right here. It's two O is a polar product. M U H E T O H is also one. And N H three and A U H. So this is acetic acid. This is ammonia. And this is ethylene. Again, what does they all have in molecules? They have these all have in common. They have hydrogen, hydrogen here, 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 and here. They can form a hydrogen box. That's where they pull the product. Now, what do they pull the products like? SN1. What do A products solve inside? SN2, because there's no hydrogen, there's no hydrogen to slow down or to form that solid shell around me and nuclear frog. So let's look at a summary table right here. The requirements for the SO1 reaction really quick, strong nucleophile, primary or secondary C plus carbokinin. SN1 reaction, you have to have a good nucleophile because you are dealing with, oh, you have to have a good leaving group because you're dealing with the weak nucleophile. And again, SN1 reactions will happen with the C plus. That's a tertiary 